Welcome to the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to be taking this idea of Rome's fingers in the pie to a new level. The deeper we go into these lectures, the clearer it becomes that we are living in critical times. Times that have never been seen before in history. When I was preparing this lecture and working on how to explain the finger in the pie, I thought, well, maybe I can do a lecture on Christianity and one on Islam and maybe one on Hinduism. And the more I looked at it, the more I realized it's actually the same thing. You see, this lecture is called Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Judaism, etc. All roads lead to Rome. What we need to find out is, is the Bible really correct when it says that the whole world wandered after the beast? It also speaks about, be careful that no man deceive you. It speaks about, be careful of whoring after other gods, the wine of Babylon. And in Revelation 18, it speaks, the Bible speaks about, come out of her, my people. And this morning's subject is heavy on the heart, as have the other been. Truth is independent of opinion. As was in the case in the other lectures, by its very definition, truth is intolerant of error. Every aspect of it petitioning the conscience for acknowledgement. You, however, as I do, hold the key to either admit or reject this information. If we had done these lectures 10 or 12, maybe 15 years ago, we would have had to look in the Bible and say, well, the Bible says this is what's going to happen in future. Now all we have to do is say, well, that's what the Bible says. Let's look into the world and see whether history, CNN, the headlines, confirm what the Bible says. We're going to continue on with this idea and this, this uh, message that's given to us in Revelation about the war that took place in heaven. Revelation 12 verses 7 to 9 say, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Now, what happened to this dragon is explained in, in verse number 9. It says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth, how much? The whole world. And he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Isaiah told us in, in Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 14, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will rise, ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Lucifer had an eye problem. <laughs> I will this, I will that, I will this. It's basically what we today know as ego. And in Revelation 12 verse 9 it says that he was cast down into the earth and his angels were cast down with him. And his angels today are what we know as demons, fallen angels. Those are the set of angels which the New Age movement or the people that are innocently involved in the New Age movement are dealing with, it with, in, with them and they don't even know it. You've got to be very careful when you're dealing with angels. One set works with heavenly things and one set fell out of heaven. And that's why Jesus said to his disciples when they asked, what must we watch for to see that we're coming to the end of the world? And Jesus' first, very first answer was, be careful that no man deceive you. So Judges in the Old Testament, in Judges 2 verses 17, speaks about whoring after other gods. Read it with me. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers had walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. Here's an indication of a group of people that were supposed to walk as their fathers had done, facing the west, facing the Shekinah glory, facing Yahweh, the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy of Holies. And they turned and started to whore after other gods. This is a type of 
uh, biblical prostitution, spiritual prostitution, whoring after other gods and obeying not the Lord's commandments. This is fulfilled in Revelation 18 verse 3 where it speaks about all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This is speaking about Babylon and about Rome. It continues and it says, And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. Just stop for a moment and have a look again. How much of the world? All nations have drunk of the wrath of her fornication. And if this is the case, then we need to be able to say, say well, we looked into Christianity, but what about the other religions? How does this whole deception work? Deception, you must remember, is a terrible thing. It is like going to the auto bank, the ATM or the teller machine of the bank, and wanting to draw money. You walk up to the bank, it looks like the bank. If you knock it, it sounds like the bank. It feels like the bank. It you, it's even beeps like the bank. Everything is fine. It looks like... It, you wouldn't consider that it possibly wouldn't be a bank. It's a normal stock standard ATM. But when you put your card in and try and withdraw money, you realize that somebody has gone and put on a false screen to deceive you into believing something that looked, sounded, felt, and, and even it seemed right to you. But when you try and get your money out, you've been deceived. Now, people often say, well, uh, I'm not deceived. See, the problem with that statement is that's exactly how deceived people think. I didn't believe I was deceived. Deception is a type of sleepiness. It's a type of being asleep that you only realize you were asleep is when you wake up. Only this morning when the alarm clock w went off did I realize that I had actually fallen asleep. In the same way, it's only when the people wake up out of deception, that they realize that they were deceived. This is Satan's greatest method of, of getting people to do something that he wants us to do, and we actually don't know what we're doing. So how does this deception filter into the other religions? Well, let's have a look. What are the other religions? This a uh, book cover by Christopher H. Partridge, or he's the editor of this book, speaks about the introduction to world religions. Which are the main world religions? On that book you can see there's a hand of a monk which is pulling the prayer beads through his fingers. This is a type of uh, ritual, I would say, or a ceremony that you would do. The prayer beads, as you would pull them through your fingers, you would say a prayer and then another prayer and another prayer. Often done both, interestingly enough, with Buddhists and with Catholics. We'll look into that a bit later. Is there somehow a link between Buddhism and Catholicism? Well, adherence.com is a famous website which explains how many people there are that adhere to a certain religion. How many Catholics are there? How many Protestants are there? How many uh, New Apostolics are there? How many Mormons are there? It's interesting to realize that uh, the New Apostolic Church, which has about 10 odd million people, is a similar size to the Mormons, who have got about 14 million people. Is a similar size to the Seventh day Adventists, who have got 14 to 16 million people around the world. These figures can be determined from various sources, but when it's collated and put together, adherence.com splits it up into this pie graph and says that 33% of the world's population belongs to Christianity. 21% belongs to Islam. There's a 16% slice, which is the non-religious, that's the agnostics, the atheists, the secular humanists, etc., people that are answering to none or no religion. Then there's a 14% slice, which is the portion of the population that focuses on Hinduism. 6%, which is African traditional and primal indigenous type religions another 6% on Chinese traditional, and then another 6% which belong to Buddhism, 0.22% Judaism, Sikhism at 0.03%, and then a slice of other. Those are people that don't fit into any of these groups. Now the Bible says the whole world will wander after the beast. So looking at that pie graph, we should be able to see an influence in pretty much every single one of those. 
Adherence.com also explains that there were five or are five main religions in the world. This quote explains, it says, during the 1800s, comparative religion scholars increasingly recognized Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism as the most significant religions. Even today, these are considered the big five. So, in line with that, this lecture covers Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Judaism. These are the big five. And if the Bible is correct, today we should be able to trace what does the news say about what the religions are doing and can we find a link between the religions and Rome. I want you to remember that this is as it was in the church of Ephesus. God hates certain religious systems, but he loves you and he loves me. The loud cry of Revelation 18 is not a, an attack on the individual. It is God's scathing rebuke of false systems of worship. And he is now calling mankind out of false systems of worship. Theology 101 explains that every, world, every one of the world religions has got two elements. You see, when Satan sets up a religion... He sets up a religion with two elements. One which is known as the exoteric section and one which is known as the esoteric section. The exoteric section is given to the masses. It's for the population, for the members on the ground. The esoteric section, however, is hidden inside. It's a secret element within each religion that only very, very few people know about. It's amazing for me to see this graphic and to see how uh, theology 101 explains that even Christianity has got both of these levels. The, the Buddhists have got both of these levels. Hindus have got both of these levels. All of the mystic religions, there's a group of people on the inside and there's the masses on the outside. Now why would there be two religions? Or why would be, there be two levels of each religion? Well, Satan does this because... Secretly inside, as the Bible says, he will be channeling worship through to him, but he cannot do that by letting the members feel uncomfortable. So he has to let them feel comfortable to go to the ATM and punch in the PIN code and slot in your, your uh, bank card. But when it comes to the day when you have to cash in, you'll see that you've been deceived. By the end of time, Satan will have had these two sections set up in all world religions. And all of those religions, even though the members believe that they're doing what they should be doing, they will be channeling worship through to Satan, unknowingly. That is deception. The true Christian church, however, is slightly different. This is now the church that Christ set up on earth. With Christ's own church, there's only one level of religion. As there should be with Christ in Matthew 13 verse 35, Christ says, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Whenever something was supposed to be covered up or done in secret, John 18, 20 was his answer. Jesus answered him saying, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whether the Jews always resort. And listen now, he says, and in secret, I have said nothing. When it comes to Jesus Christ, everything is on the same level. There's no secret insider esoteric group that knows a little bit more than you do. With Jesus Christ, all cards are on the table and he says, test it, prove it, have a look at it and decide for yourself what you want to keep. That's also why you'll see all these world religions making theological mind-blowing adjustments by a couple of people where, that the affects the entire church. Even in the New Apostolic Church, all decisions made are all done under secrecy. All the apostles are bound to a certain level of secrecy. They, uh, there's a difference between confidentiality and secrecy. Remember this. Confidentiality, when you're speaking in private to your members, that's called confidentiality. But when certain things are done in secret, that's a different order of the day. So with God, there was only one level. But with Satan, there are two. The secret one, 
and the marketed one. Now, in order for me to run into these various religions, I need to explain to you for a moment how the secret societies work. So I'm going to pull a handbrake up on this lecture for a moment and run into the secret societies and then pull down the handbrake again so that we can somehow put this information into religion so that it all makes sense. Let's put this into context because Satan, keeping things hidden from us, has to embed this information inside secret societies which then infiltrate and allow people to be deceived in the worst way possible. This graphic by Gary H. Carr explains the way his studies have led him to believe that the ancient mystery religions have led to witchcraft, sorcery, divination, spiritism, and most of the occult practices, even Hinduism and Buddhism and Shintoism. We'll get to that just now. Of those ancient religions, he says this belonged to Babylon, Egypt, India, Persia, Greece, all of these were forms of pantheism. Pantheism is the belief that God is in everything. God is in me, God is in you, God is in the chair you're sitting on, God is in your TV, God is in your coffee cup. This is the idea of pantheism which today has grown into panentheism. Gary Carr says that it formed in the ancient religions but it moved then through to Kabbalism. The Kabbalah, as we know today, which is permeated throughout the Jewish hierarchy. Most rabbis in the world today find themselves as Kabbalists. From Kabbalism, it moved through to Gnosticism, the belief that Jesus wasn't really God. From Gnosticism through to the Knights Templars, from the Knights Templars through to the Rosicrucians, and from the Rosicrucians through to Freemasonry and the Illuminati. Now, we mentioned the Illuminati, people say, oh, conspiracy theories. Well... Just hold on a second. Let's go through these lectures and you make up your own mind. Interesting, he says that from Freemasonry and the Illuminati come Marxism, that Freemasonry and the Illuminati control the American and the European political secret societies, that they control the international banking elite, and mind-blowingly enough, he points Freemasonry that it's controlling and influencing the world council of churches not only that from freemasonry and the illuminati have come or led on to this new age movement idea where people in their innocence are using crystals and and uh, dream weavers and various ideas of angels to help them with their future and this mind power well that comes through the the illuminati through the the influence of the freemasons and obviously the jesuits Freemasonry also, uh, through it, was founded, the Theosophical Society, by a lady, um, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. And what you'll also see is that there's many, uh, many names which you can quote, but when you want to find out who's really in control of these systems, there's only a couple who really know everything. One would be Albert Pike. One would be Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. One would be Alice A. Bailey, Annie Besant. Those names become the foundations of many of the systems which are found in the world today. This graphic which Gary Carr explains, he says, one has led on to the other, and basically they've just developed into different marketing plans of the original agent, ancient pagan beliefs. Morals and Dogma is a book which will be mentioned quite regularly throughout the rest of this lecture, and some of those to come for that matter. Albert Pike was an interesting gentleman. He wrote a book called Morals and Dogma, which I'll show you in a later lecture, is the book you receive when you become a Shriner Freemason. A Shriner Freemason being the, 30, the 33rd degree Freemason is the one who receives the Shriner cap. Remember that a shrine is a temple. So this is a type of high priest of the shrine or a high priest of the temple. How does this fit in? Let's go to that Morals and Dogma book of the ancient and accepted Scottish writer written by Albert Pike himself. And he'll tell us that the Templars were gravely accused of spitting upon Christ and denying God at their receptions of gross obscenities, conversations with female devils and a worship of a monstrous idol. He continues on page 817. The Templars, now listen to this, like all 
other secret orders and associations had two doctrines. One concealed and reserved for the masters, which was known as Johannism. That's the inside esoteric hidden one called Johannism. The other, which is public, which was Roman Catholic. Albert Pike is explaining here as the, the pinnacle of Freemasonry, the, the most influential person in the history of Freemasonry, who wrote the Bible of Freemasonry, Morals and Dogma, he says that Johannism was the name of the secret insider um, organization or religion called Johannism, and the outer marketing uh, option given to the public is called Roman Catholicism. Now, why do we use Albert Pike as an example? Well, here are some of his titles. His titles included Sovereign Grand Commander of the Supreme Council of the 33rd Degree, which is the Mother Council of the World. He was Supreme Pontiff of, the universe, of Universal Freemasonry, scholar, student of ancient languages, occult philosopher. He completely rewrote the degrees of Scottish Rite into their present form. The work explained in his book, Morals and Dogma of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. His position in Masonry was and is today unparalleled, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. This is the man who, who if you want to know what's going on in Freemasonry, you speak to Albert Pike. He says, Roman Catholicism is the outsider marketing plan given to the members, to the cattle, to the catechumen. They call us the catechumen, the goyim, to make them feel comfortable that they can continue doing something that seems to be right. Meantime, they are part of an insider, esoteric, hidden group called Johannism. You'll see on many of his documents and other papers issued in the, in the Freemasonry environment, you'll see that logo or that motto we discussed yesterday, Ordo Apkao. You'll see it there where the double-headed eagle is, Ordo Abkao, order out of chaos. Interestingly, that above that you'll see the triangle, the 33 degree inside it, or the number 33 with the sun shining out of it. This is the representation of the Luciferian all-seeing eye, but we'll get into that just now. Also, the double-headed eagle representing the double-faced God, the God that faces this way and that. Janusz was also the God that faced this way and that. It also represents the one that can do good and evil. The one can be male and female. That's only Lucifer that can do that. Also, if you go into the, uh, the more senior temples, you'll see on some of the stained glass windows IHS, which is similar to what you would see in a Roman Catholic cathedral or in a church. IHS, which we are taught today, the outsider, the exoteric people, or members are taught in his service. That's what it means. What it actually stands for, Isis, Horus, and Set, three of the gods of the ancient rites of Egypt. In the digest of Masonic law, it is said that masonry has nothing to do with the Bible. It is not founded upon the Bible, for if it were, it would not be masonry, it would be something else. Many Freemasons come to me and say to me, well, uh, I feel quite comfortable being involved in Freemasonry because it's a Christian organization. Well, they might be telling you that at whatever level you are. But if you are of the lower Masons, even the middle Masons, even some of the upper Masons don't have a clue what they're part of. These, this is the reason why I'm quoting from their documentation so that you know what you really p find yourself as, as part of at the moment. Manly Palmer Hall, who was a 33rd degree Freemason, in the book The Lost Keys of Freemasonry on page 65, he says, A true Mason is not creed-bound. Christ, Buddha, or Muhammad, the name means little, for he recognizes only the light and not the bearer. He worships at every shrine, bows before every altar, whether in the temple, mosque, cathedral, realizing with his truer understanding of the oneness of all spiritual truth. So for a true Freemason, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or a Buddhist or a, or a Shintoist or whatever, Hindu. makes no difference because they are all part of the same energy. J.D. Buck explains in his book Mystic Masonry, it is far more important that men should strive to become Christ's than that they should believe that Jesus was Christ. One of the goals of Freemasonry which the lower Masons don't understand is that 
The system leads you up towards becoming Christ. Or a type of Christ, as it were. And through every incarnation of your life, it's based on the idea of the ability to reincarnate. Through every incarnation and through your life, you can work yourself towards the Godhead. So let's ask the question out straight. Mr. Pike, Albert Pike, you know what's going on in Freemasonry. Can you please tell us, are the lower levels of Masonry misled? Let's look in his book on page 819 and see what it says. The blue degrees, that's the first three, are but the outer court of the portico of the temple. Part of the symbols are displayed there to the initiate, but he is intentionally misled by false interpretations. It is not intended that he shall understand them, but it is intended that he shall imagine he understands them. Their true explication is reserved for the adepts, the princes of masonry. The whole body of the royal and sacerdotal art was hidden so carefully centuries since. Where? In the higher degrees. This is an admission from Albert Pike saying that if you really want to know what's going on, you've got to get to the top of the system. The lower levels don't really have a, have a clue. They are intentionally misled, and it's done by using symbols. The reason they do that is you've got to go back into the Bible to Genesis 11, where the Tower of Babel was being built, and God said, one world, one language, one system, no. Many nations, many tongues, no Tower of Babel. From that point on, mankind... Had a, had a bit of a problem. They could no longer converse using languages. And Satan was very angry at this. And from that point, and I'll show you the quotes just now, that's believed in Freemasonry that the Tower of Babel and builder Nimrod was the first Freemason. And that from that moment onward, no longer being able to use speech, they would communicate their secret insider doctrines by using symbols. And that's why symbols will become so, so important throughout the rest of these lectures. Let's have a look back into morals and dogma at what Albert Pike says on page 104 to 105. Masonry, like all the religions, all the mysteries, hermeticism and alchemy, conceals its secrets from all except the adepts and sages or the elect and uses false explanations and misinterpretations of its symbols to mislead those who deserve only to be misled, to conceal the truth which it calls light from them and to draw them away from it. Truth is not for those who are unworthy or unable to receive it, or would prefer it. So masonry jealously conceals its secrets and intentionally leads conceited interpreters astray. Not only does he admit here that masonry, like all other religions, so masonry is a religion, it conceals what it's really about and it hides it in the high degrees in what they call the sages or the adepts and it conceals the truth from people who will just pervert it. One of the most well-marketed aspects of Freemasonry is that it's a whites-only, male-only secret society. Well, here's an image of Mrs. Elizabeth Aldworth in full Masonic regalia. A whites-only, male-only organization? Not necessarily. Here's uh, an image of Annie Basant, who was a 33-degree Freemason, and we'll get to find out what that is very soon. A 33-degree Freemason, and they call her Brother Animus Basant. See, this is a continuation of ancient Pharaoh times, where when the, the Pharaoh, who was, always had to be male, was for a time female, they would draw her with a beard. In today's world, the females within Freemasonry, when they get to the levels, they call her Brother Anibasant. What about black people and Dark-skinned people, are they allowed in Freemasonry? Oh, absolutely. It's not well known, but Prince Hall Freemasonry is the, the Freemasonry and the various rungs you can go through as a black person. Here are images of, uh, f from Florida and Rhode Island. You've got David L. Wright as the, the Grand Master. 
Here on the right hand side you've got the worthy grand matron Martha M. Claiborne and worthy grand patron Albert L. Middleton. These are black people within Freemasonry. If you didn't know this, and that woman can be a 33rd degree Freemason, a lady, well, if you didn't know that, then what else don't you know? You see, Charles G. Burgess says that the symbols became to have two meanings, the esoteric and the exoteric, the one for the hidden group inside and the one for the masses outside. The esoteric meaning was the true or original meaning understood only by a few and closely guarded by them. The exoteric meaning was the invented or modified explanation intended for the many. These sacred mysteries were often merely continuations of simpler forms of early sex worship carried on by a select few. Encyclopedia of Freemasonry on page 52 and 53 says, The all-seeing eye is one of these symbols. It is an all-important symbol of the supreme being borrowed by the Freemasons from the nations of antiquity. On the same principle, the Egyptians represented Osiris, their chief deity, by the symbol of an open eye and placed their hieroglyphic of him on all their temples. So the eye, the, either the left eye or the right eye, became the symbol in ancient uh, times, in ancient Egypt. And not only was it a symbol of Osiris, who we'll find out who that is in one of the later lectures about death. We'll find out who Osiris is, but not only was this his symbol, the one eye, they put that eye on all the temples. Why then would you find this symbol on a Mason temple? Why would you find the all-seeing eye as the symbol inside Freemasonry? Who does that symbolize? Well, they tell us that it symbolizes Osiris. Robert also explains in his America's Secret Destiny that to the ancient Egyptians, the right eye symbolized the sun and the left eye the moon. Do you remember the symbol that we looked at yesterday inside, or the secret uh, sun worship symbols inside Roman Catholicism, where they take the Eucharist, which has got that big sun around it, and they put it inside the crescent moon? Well, the right eye and the left eye symbolize exactly that. They symbolize the sun and the moon. This is the repetition of the same ancient sun worship rituals. Encyclopedia of Freemasonry on page 114 says that Baal, whenever the Israelites made one of their almost periodical deflections to idolatry, Baal seems to have been the favorite idol to whose worship they addicted themselves. In Tyre, Baal was the sun, and Ashtaroth the moon. Baal Peor, the lord of priapism, was the sun represented as the generative principle of nature and identical with the phallus of other religions. Baal Gad was the lord of the multitude of stars, that is, the sun as the chief of the heavenly host. In brief, Baal seems to have been, wherever the cultus was active, a development of the old sun worship. How does sun worship fit into Freemasonry? We'll find out now. But what you'll see often is you've got the compass and you've got the set square and inside the set square you will have the G. Now they'll tell the, the goyim, the lower order, the cattle, the catechumen, they'll tell them that means God, G for God. No, the truth is G stands for generative principle. It's a fulfillment of an ancient pagan, uh, pagan sex rite where generative principle was also pointing towards sun worship, as is the obelisk pointing towards the sun and the combination of the two being the phallic sex worship and the continuation of these reproductive rites. So let's ask, who is the God of Masonry? Mr. Pike, could you please tell us, who is your God? As a 33rd degree Freemason, who do you worship? From his book on page 321 in Morals and Dogma, it says, Lucifer the light bearer, strange and mysterious name to be given to the spirit of darkness, Lucifer the son of the morning. It is he who bears the light and with its splendors intolerable blinds feeble, sensual or selfish souls. Well, doubt it not. In the next quotation you can see how he expands on this idea. That which we must say to a crowd is we worship a God, but it is the God that one adores without superstition. So this is what they market publicly. 
to you, Sovereign Grand Inspectors General, this is the insider group, we say this, that you may repeat it to the brethren of the 32nd, the 31st, and the 30th degrees. The Masonic religion should be, by all of us initiates, of the high degrees, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. So according to Albert Pike, who is allowed to know it? The 30th degree, the 31st degree, and the 32nd degree. And you'll notice that he says, you may repeat this. Not, you will repeat this. James Shaw is, a, is an example of a 32nd degree Freemason that had no idea what he was part of until he went through the Shriner initiation. We'll get to that just now. Albert Pike says that, yes, Lucifer is God. And unfortunately, Adonai is also God. Notice that he says Lucifer is God with a capital G and Adonai is God with a small g. Thus the true and pure philosophical religion is the belief in Lucifer, the equal of Adonai. But Lucifer, God of light and God of good, is struggling for humanity against Adonai, the God of darkness and evil. So this is what it's about. Who is the God of Freemasonry? Lucifer. And he's at war between, or at war with Adonai, struggling over humanity. This is exactly the same as what the Bible says. It's just saying it from the other side. The Bible says that Adonai, or God, Michael, Jesus, he who is what God is, is struggling against the God of darkness, the prince of this world. Here they're saying, Lucifer, true and almighty God, is struggling against Adonai, the God of darkness. They just turn everything upside down. Same as what they do with the cross. They turn it upside down. They take the truth and they make the God of the Bible the God of of Masonic darkness. This image explains where the layout of a Masonic temple. You'll see there, as you walk in, on the right in front of you is east, where you face the worshipful master. And on your left is what they call north, and then in brackets, the place of Masonic darkness. Now, where does this come from? Well, that's why I was referring to it in our previous lecture. Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 14. Who's in the north? Well, let's have a look. Do you remember Lucifer fell from heaven? He said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit, now listen, also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. So he wants to sit there where God is. So who's in the sides of the north? God. So when you come down to earth and you have your own shrine or your own temple and you call East and west and north, etc., you call north the place of Masonic darkness because that's where God sits. Now, just as you did in the old temple, you would have to either choose facing west and face the Shekinah glory, God, and worship Yahweh, or turn your back on God and face east and worship the sun in one or other form. It's the same thing that is done today. Let's take the temple for a moment, the sanctuary, the, the, the tabernacle as you've seen, and let's take that image of the floor layout of the temple of Freemasonry and put them back to back. And let's see how this works. You'll see by this graphic that Freemasonry is the inverse of the sanctuary and the tabernacle of God. You can either face west and follow the Christian Jesus Christ's doctrines and guidelines and worship Yahweh, or you can become involved in some secret order, some secret society, and without possibly even knowing it, be turned to face east and fulfill some sort of sun worship religion. Now, is this possible? Can it be true? Well, let's go into the Masonic Temple. This is Albert Pike's own personal lodge, lodge number 162. And he says, to study and seek to interpret correctly the symbols of the universe is the work of the sage and philosopher. It is to decipher the writing of God. So the true writings of their God is hidden in the symbols. And to decipher that is the work of a sage. Well, you don't have to be a sage. I'm certainly not. I'm a stock standard member of the congregation. I'm not even a pastor. But if you understand the language, then you'll see that they're busy discussing things in this world which you possibly previously wouldn't have been aware of. 
As you walk into this lodge, you'll see there's the statue saying, shh. Now they'll say, keep quiet. This is a temple. Well, no, not necessarily. What it actually stands for is secrecy. And as you stand there in front of this temple, it says on the floor, all who read here stand facing the east. So you might not even know that you're fulfilling some sort of uh, a sun worship system, but you're doing it anyway. Let's pop back in history to the Bacchus temple. Remember Bacchus was the god of revelry and drunkenness? Well, let's go to the Bacchus temple of ancient times. This is what it looked like. You see those massive pillars and constructions? Well, these were ancient pagan temples. Let's pop across to the Jupiter temple. You can see here on top of the stairs is a person standing. Look at the size of the person compared to the size of the pillars. These were massive buildings. The money wasn't an object at that time. Here's an image of a top of a pillar that fell out. The one with the lion's head on it here. That's the top of a pillar. I'm going to zoom in and see. Can you see anything? Do you notice anything on there? You see the swastika? Well, these are the Jupiter temple was just one example of a sun worship type temple. It was a place where they would worship all these pagan religions, including the sun. And the swastika was a symbol of sun worship. You'll see here on ancient Roman and post-Roman periods, the swastika was often used. It was used right down back throughout, uh, throughout pagan history. The swastika is found all over the place as a symbol of sun worship. Let's now go back to Albert Pike's Lodge and have a look around. You'll see there on their regalia, you see the sun on the chest on these, in these garments that they wear. And then just stop for a moment and look up at the ceiling. As you look at the ceiling, you'll see up there on the ceiling is the swastika of the sun symbol. Now, why would that be there? Well, all you have to do is turn a little bit around and you'll see the dragon on the side. Or if you go outside the temple, you'll see the sun god Ra with his wings outstretched to protect and look after the people. Freemasonry at the highest level is a method of sun worship. And it doesn't matter if the swastika is this way or that way. Just like they use the eye, the left eye or the right eye, the sun and the moon. Or Satan comes as the one who does good or evil or is male or female. The swastika is that way or that way. It makes no difference. The Encyclopedia of Freemasonry says that those brethren who delight to trace our emblems to an astronomical origin find in the compass a symbol of the sun and the circular pivot representing the body of the luminary and the diverging legs his rays. Hardly any of the symbols of Freemasonry are more important in their signification or more extensive in their application than the sun. The sun, too, as the regenerator or reviver of all things, is the phallic worship which made a prominent part of the mysteries. So this well-known triangle that you see, the compass with the set square, well, the compass, those downsides, are the legs of the rays of the sun, with that disk in the middle being the sun, the luminary body itself, the lumination of Lucifer. The, the set square at the bottom, well, you just have to let your mind wander a little bit to figure out what that is, considering that the G in between is the generative principle. Have a look inside this temple with me, and the first thing that you'll see is the floor is covered with black and white squares. You'll also see as you walk down towards the front, in front of you sitting the worshipful master there on the east. On the right hand side is the west, and on the left hand side, do you remember what it was? It was the place of Masonic darkness, the north. And there you'll see there is no little altar or special chair. On the floor, you'll find the black and white squares with the, the set square and compass with the G for generative principle inside. Not only that, you'll see the symbol of the sun around it. So here you have all these symbols having esoteric hidden meanings understood only by the sages and the adepts, the bosses of Freemasonry, while the goyam, the cattle, the catacumen don't have a clue what's going on. So, Sun worship seems to be the order of the day regarding uh, the, the type of worship of Satan in the Old Testament. 
In other words, they turned their back on the temple of God and they faced the east and they worshipped the sun towards the east, which was called an abomination by God. Well, today it's the same thing. The sun worship, one of the ways of getting that into the system is through Freemasonry, which is a religion, according to Albert Pike, and its foundations are those of sun worship. So, the question is, how does this information and how do these secret societies look about or go about infiltrating Christianity? Can we find some of these elements inside Christianity and Islam and Hinduism and Buddhism and Judaism? Is it possible? Well, all we have to do is go back to Ephesians 5, verse 8 to 14. It says there, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless seeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful to even mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by light becomes visible, for, the, by, for it is light that makes everything visible. Using that text and looking into the secret societies, let's see how Satan is misleading the world. Here's an image of that triangle with the all-seeing eye behind it or in the eye inside the triangle with a sun symbol around it. This is found on a Roman Catholic pulpit in France. What is it doing there? Here's an image from Russia where the all-seeing eye inside that triangle with the sun symbol around it is the one who's sending down the blessing onto Jesus Christ. This is the one to be claiming to be God who's sending down the Holy Spirit. Well, we know who the all-seeing eye is. The one side is Osiris as the one type of God. This is certainly not our God, the Yahweh of the Bible. An image also out of the Catholic Church, this image of the wandering bishops. And you'll see the gentleman on the right hand side in the red with his two fingers across his chest. We'll get to explain exactly who that is very shortly. But you'll see on their uh, tiaras, on their caps that they wear, you'll see on the bottom there, the all-seeing eye with the sun symbol around it again, inside the triangle. Here's another one in a confessional in a cathedral of Milano, Italy. Do you remember we had a look at St. Paul's Cathedral, the Anglican Protestant system that was set up to protest against Rome being the Antichrist and the papacy being the head? Do you remember that? Do you remember what it used to look like? There's an image of it. Do you remember what it looks like today? Well, there's an image of it. There's even one from the street. Is it possible that somehow this secret infiltration has taken place and so change the building style, but not only outwardly, what about inside? Well, let's go inside. What's the very first thing that you notice on this image? The black and white squares. Can you see the black and white squares go from the entrance all the way through into the area there where the altar is? And we'll get there in a minute. I just want to explain to you, what do these black and white squares mean? Well, you see, the arg argument of Lucifer is, goes right back to Eden. It goes back to the time of, you will not die, you will become like gods, knowing what? Knowing the difference between good and evil. The black and white squares on the floor represent man walking with the knowledge of good and evil. Man walking on black and white squares. You see, they turn it upside down. They say, it is Lucifer who is the worshipped one. It is he who freed mankind from the tyranny of not knowing good and evil. He's the good guy. God is the bad guy for wanting to have kept this away from man. So now mankind can walk with the knowledge of good and evil. And that is represented through these black and white squares. Let's look for a moment up towards one of the, the, almost in the ceiling, one of the arches. And what do we see? There we see the phoenix rising out of the ashes, which is the symbol given by Freemasonry to ordo ab kawa, ordo out of chaos. And above the phoenix you have the sun. In the mosaic in, on the floor in St. Paul's Cathedral, you also have these symbols of the sun with a face in it. And you have the, the, the bent rays and the straight rays. Not only that, you have the symbols of the sun and the moon. These are all embedded openly for everyone to see. 
And as you'll see in a later lecture, there's this uh, explanation by symbols are everywhere. Some people understand them. Most of people don't. So here people are walking through St. Paul's Cathedral not having a clue what they're walking over. Also, inside the Anglican Church, you have the symbol of IHS. Whether it's in the baptismal bowls or in the communion cups or on their drapes and their cloths, you'll see the sun symbol everywhere and IHS standing for Isis, Horus, and Set. Scarily, they've even got the interwoven so-called symbol of David. This double triangle, the one pointing up, the one pointing down with the cross in the center. And then when we stop for a moment and we look right up at the ceiling, what do we see? There we have the sun symbol with the PX. PX, interestingly enough, Kathy Burns tells us in her expose on these secret symbols that the PX stands for the staff of Osiris, which is the, the, the mast that was in the boat of he that goes through the underworld after death. Sun symbols, sun symbols, sun symbols. Let's go for a moment up onto one of the higher floors and look back down to that black and white square phenomenon that we saw earlier. This is now looking down towards the altar. I tell you what, let's go a little bit closer to the altar and then look straight down over the gallery. What do you see? What you're seeing here is basically a witch's coven. This is laid out in St. Paul's Cathedral in black and white squares in a similar fashion to a witch's coven. Let's go back a little bit lower back onto the ground floor and you'll see on the ground floor the black and white pentagram. And you'll see with the writing com just coming through on top there, you'll see that this is with a pentagram pointing with the point down, which is in the shape of the goat with the two horns, horns pointed up. These symbols are everywhere throughout St. Paul's Cathedral. For anyone who is a sage, an adept, or somebody that understands the language, for anyone to see. This one clinches it of all of them. Let's look one more time back up towards the ceiling. And what do you see? There you see the symbol of Freemasonry. The luminary with the two legs, the compass, and then the set square. And over it is the all-seeing eye of Lucifer with a sun symbol. How does this all fit together? Well, Time magazine says, Hail Mary! Catholics have long revered her, but now Protestants are finding their own reasons to celebrate the mother of Jesus. We're going to have to look into this in a little bit more depth. Because in Revelation 18, God is calling man, come out of her, my people. Come out of false systems of worship. And I get resistance when people say, but why are you dealing with all this satanic stuff? And I'm saying, well, that's exactly what Revelation explains. How do you know you're part of a satanic system if you are deceived? If you are asleep, somebody has to wake you up. Wake up, wake up. And Revelation 18 speaks about these churches and these worship systems becoming the habitation of devils and every unclean spirit. Well, this is going to become clearer and clearer as we move now through these lectures. But understand that Revelation 18 is calling us out of false systems of worship. He's calling us out of error and into truth. The question is, if he's calling us out of error, he's going to have to call us into truth. If he's calling us out of this room, you automatically have to go outside or into another room. So if he's calling us out, he must also tell us where to go into. We'll be covering this in the lecture entitled The Final Confrontation. This place, for, which is the, a, a sort of leftover haven, which is filled of people that have listened to this call, come out of false systems of worship, my people. Come out, be with me. That group of people is going to be Satan's most hated enemy. And we're going to have to find out, not only from the Bible, what does the Bible say about those people, but we're going to have to find out, what does Satan say about those people? Who does he hate most? Who does Satan hate most? Because the people that ha Satan hates most is going to be the people that Jesus loves most. Come with me into the second section of this lecture. We're going to be looking through what we've just looked through is Christianity. Now we're going to be going into Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Judaism. Is it possible that all of them link back to Rome?